Long ago, in the ancient land of Wisconsin, a group of nerds delved deep into the depths of Milwaukee Area Technical College. It was neither gold nor silver they sought, but knowledge of video games and the video game industry. They called this epic journey, The Dev Quest. Welcome to the Dev Quest, the podcast where we talk about video games and the video game industry. I'm your host, John Harwood, and I'm joined by Jason Wisniewski, Annie Ehlers, George Madison, and that's it, just us four. Uh, and today's hot topic is the Oculus Rift and what the uh, what is it called? The commercial actual uh, the commercial kits. price. So not not the development kits, but the actual price of the Oculus. Uh, apparently, it came out that is going to cost five hundred. $99, yes. roughly, for to, pre-orders. For pre-orders, yeah. okay. So what do you, what do you guys think of this? I think the general sort of uh, internet thinks that that's quite a lot. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. But, I mean, it's it's worth it. But is the question is, is it really, though? Well, I think people are kind of pissed because, like, they, they saw that, like, uh, dev kits for the Oculus were, like, how much were they? They were, like, 200, 250-something? I think they're 300-some okay. right now. So it was, it was closer to, like, that number. And I think people were just kind of taken aback by the fact that the, actually this technology is going to cost, like, way more. That is kind of strange, though, because, like, if you think about it, you only, you'd be playing, like, really, really, it, what it is is hardware. So you'd be, you know, paying for hardware. You can't actually insert something into the Oculus and play the game. Other than that, you'd have to plug the Oculus into, like, a PC. So, essentially, like, let's say you bought, like, a, a three $400 laptop that is, like, really well. You'd be paying a lot more for just a piece of equipment that you couldn't play anything right. with. Right. Yeah, I think, one, I think, so I guess this is going to turn into more of just like a general sort of uh, uh, VR discussion. But my thing is that like v, VR is a very cool idea. And I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be around for a while. But I always kind of compare uh, VR sort of more to like what like 3D movies are to the movie industry. Because like fundamentally it's not going to change a whole lot. Uh, about video games, but it will still be there for people that want to go out there and spend the extra money. I think like you're extra underestimating extra the VR technology. I, I, I've only had very limited experiences with it, but to me, I think it's going to be an investment because I, I think it's going to like change the way that the video game industry is going to be because they're going to start developing for the VR stuff. And like, I don't, I don't really think it's a fair comparison for like 3D movies because that's all kind of crappy. I don't know. I mean, you get the the, the stupid. Glasses. glasses and it just kind of makes things pop out a little bit where VR you're in a completely immersive experience where you look around and like you move forward and stuff and you like you're actually in this world I don't know I mean uh, like I kind of agree with you but at the same time you also have to think about yeah while it is cool people will start developing for uh, you know the Oculus, but at the same time, it's it's a whole risk factor still. So like they'll have to integrate whatever they have into that, which is a risk factor because if their game sucks, then they're they don't make a profit off of it. Well, that's a risk for any platform. That's true, but now that the platform, like with new consoles, you know, it's easier to just be like, okay, we just have to upgrade our equipment versus okay, now we have to change gears altogether and make something completely new we barely tried before. I don't know. I think VR. It's come a long way from what it used to be, but I think that right now, with what it is, I think if people would want to get a whole immersive experience, which is that when they move, their character moves, and that when they move their arm, their character's arm moves, you would need to get a whole setup like they've had at E3, where it's mm -hmm. the station and... Yeah. yeah. That... Where you have, like, the, the Omni and, like, the, like... Motion yeah, there's some really gun. cool stuff yeah. that would be, be hella expensive. Yeah. But, like, they had a, a VR convention not too long ago where they showed off, like, all the different stuff. And they're, like, these battle stations that you get hooked up into. And you're, like, walking on, like, this big treadmill. And, like, you're, like that stuff is really cool. Obviously, that's not going to be, like, living room equipment, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah I, well, the question is, like, they'll, they'll probably uh, wonder how they can bring that into the living room. And that's probably, like, a thing that's currently being under or I don't know underdeveloped. It could I think it could e actually easily be put into the living room because be. I mean the thing is people said like oh the Wii Fit that could never be in a living room they just shrunk it down yeah and I I think even taking that Wii Fit concept even further if you actually get obviously this would be something expensive but if you get that bigger equipment it could also be sold as some sort of like 
fitness thing. Like, get exercise mm -hmm. if they put out, like, exercise videos and the VR or something like that. Where you're, like, fully immersed in this thing, but you're on this treadmill-like thing, and you're actually getting a workout while you're doing it. Well, so, well essentially, they wouldn't even point. have to make, like, something like Wii Fit anymore. They just have to be in a game, I mean, yeah. actually. Yeah. So, like, I mean, I could imagine that for games like shooters, that would be... Really? Crazy. Yeah. The one thing is that, as far as with that, that would lead to a whole bunch of risks, which I'm not going to go into right now. With oh, those VR. About those. But, yeah. Um, the whole mental I, thing. I, yeah, but I think that VR and AR are kind of... I think AR right at this moment is ahead of VR because AR has a bit more... Um, how should I put it? They have a bit more leeway with what they can do because, I mean, I think all of... I think most people have... By AR, least, you mean augmented. VR. Yeah, I think most people have seen or at least heard of um, Pokemon Go. Mm -hmm. And it's that... That right now, even in its like alpha state, still looks really nice. Right. And I mean, considering they're still working on it and how things are going, is that apparently they're currently working on a battle system, which, from the small bit I've seen, it looks really interesting. And I think if they keep on playing this out correctly, you're going to see people walking around with their phone, and then you you'll this. see them like turn randomly because they'll see a Pokemon, and they'll go like, oh, I gotta get it, I gotta get it, and you'll see them like dashing down the hallway, and it's like... Well, I think it's going to be really interesting because of that. Um, one other thing that um, I think AR is kind of getting ahead on is that it's building a bit on holograms, not to the point of it, but close to. Right, right. Yeah, so I, I agree that I think... So That's true. I think that AR is probably going to go farther than VR, because just because I think VR, it's sort of... It doesn't really change a whole lot. I mean, not necessarily like VR as in like a general thing, including like the Omni, but I just mean like VR goggles. I think that VR goggles aren't going to change a whole lot as far as game development goes because it's, it's not changing anything. Pretty much the face. only sort of thing like mechanically or input wise is changing is that now you can turn your head sort of like on its side and like look at things like sideways, which I think there are some cool possibilities go, there. You can go full 360. Well, you, you can, but I'm just saying the only thing, you, can, the only, you can't really achieve that sort of thing where you tilt your head sideways with like a mouse and keyboard. Yeah. Well, yeah, but if, you, if you've got like a controller with it where you've got like, even like a Wii controller set up where you've got the Wii and the nunchuck, where you look down and you've got like, I'm thinking Samus, where you've got like the gun arm and uh -huh. stuff and you like, you click and you pew, pew, pew. Well, couldn't that just be achieved with, like, mouse, keyboard, or a controller? Well, it could be, but it's not going to give you that full well, visual that, experience. That's what I'm saying, is that it, it, it's, it, it can be achieved the same way with mouse, keyboard, or controller, but it's just cooler to do it with the Oculus. And so that's what I think the main flaw of VR goggles is, is that they're, they're not, like, really revolutionizing anything. You know they're just making something that already exists cooler. You know what is going to revolutionize? What's going to revolutionize, Jason? Porn. Okay, well, we're already on a side tangent about porn. That is true. Actually. What I'm a way saying. to start the podcast. It's, there are That's articles true. about it out there already. Oh, you're talking about really? VR porn. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I thought you just talking about porn randomly. No, um, no. no, like VR porn is going to revolutionize the whole industry. Yeah, for I, I don't so want to get too deep the, into this, obviously. So that's but. my exact same argument there, is that, well, you could just watch porn, like, on a screen. Yeah, but, but you, you could. Can look down. But you it. could have a full visual experience. You can't feel it, but you can see it. You can see it so much. Oh, I don't want to get too deep into this. No, no, like, seriously. Oh. Like no, I don't, I don't even want to talk about it at all. But, um, I was going to say, like, just thinking about it, like, with uh, AR actually, um, if they do like develop the technology, I'm actually gonna so I'm gonna I'm gonna put out a guess out there for the entire world, and you can all track it now. And I want to say five years we're gonna have holographic Pokemon. That is my that is That'd my be awesome. I wouldn't I would say VR a bit Pokemon? more than five. A bit but than five you do mean imagine. hologram Pokemon? So yeah. like. Pokemon. Like actual holograms. Like, like actual hollow. That yeah. there'd be like a disc that floats on the ground and it would project a picture. That would be... So like Yu-Gi-Oh! Something <laughs> like that. In the show. Yeah, yeah I, something like that. I think that would be awesome. But the thing is, I... I, you guys know Jeff Fleetwood, right? Yeah. He's on this. He's been like actually sort of been in the in the rafters on like separate podcasts from this. But uh, he he I, he's a really big tech guy, and I was asking him like, okay, so how Jeff, how far away are we from having like straight up like holograms, like Star Wars style, just like projecting up from the floor? And he was like, he was like, didn't he was like really unsure because like he says that like there needs to be like something that's like reflecting, mm -hmm. like the light the light particles. I but think that. What it would be closer to, personally, is that it would be more that, that we would just end up wearing, like, goggles or contact lenses. That right. it would just, 
we would see them all the time, and we just mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think that I would probably be an easier, a more refined version of the Oculus. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I mean, it would be well, kind of similar case, to the Hollow, like the Google Glasses. I guess if if that's yeah. the case, then like if we if we think of it that way, then Oculus does have a lot of potential, well, at least Pokemon wise, because like, if they make a well, I don't I don't know well because the, the, the Oculus problem. still has to be hooked into something. So actually, never mind. Like if it doesn't, like let's say they had like a, a wireless version of it, uh, and they made it to where uh, as long it's as you portable. have like portable, like it would I don't have know the to Samsung be, version is, but yeah, like, but it would have to be how do I word it portable yet. Um, fashionable i guess would be the correct term because if yeah. you're just wearing like this giant headset around in like normal right. people would kind of look at you like you're kind of nuts yeah, yeah. so it has but if you're like just wearing glasses. glasses then google glasses like yeah. google glasses and then are and then you get to like you know well isn't that the isn't that kind of how pokemon go is going anyway they're using it on with the phones. phones yeah like but like more, eventually you know more than likely they'll probably eventually like, it probably will get yeah, to they're that gonna point. try and probably develop the car yeah they just kind of so. want to make it where it is now, so everyone can just reach it. Or you, you probably still need your phone anyway. Like you probably just hook your phone up to Google Glass and then probably. see through there. So all in all, do you guys think the price point is going to be worth it? Like as an investment, where the potential might be. Um, I don't know. Like that, that's still a really tough question. I think they, they put this six hundred dollar price up there. I think for early adopters because they know that there are a lot of oh, people yeah. that are enthusiastic about this kind of oh, thing. For oh, for sure. So, so they the casual get that person money. isn't going to be getting a VR machine. Yeah, that's for sure. I, I think early money. when it drops down to like where the dev kits were like three hundred dollars, then I'll probably think about investing in a VR machine. Yeah. But until then. I probably I'm probably not going to be too interested in it. I personally won't be investing in it until it gets closer to the two hundred mark. Okay. Because to me, I our regular game stations are even two hundred. Right, but you it's just considering it's all it is is just a screen that goes on your face. That's all the Oculus is. You don't realize the complexity of the Oculus. Oh, I, I get the complexity it. of that, and I get how will people enjoy it. That they like it when that when you move your head, it moves with you. Yeah. But it's that to me, I can. That's a very small thing. To me, it's largely just that they just move the screen closer to you. And they also add, like, you know, they add 3D as well. Mm -hmm. Like, that's also big. And I think that's really cool. But it's that you can even do the 3D on a 3D TV. Right. So, and I mean, 3D TVs are only 200 some dollars right now. Right. I, I honestly don't think it, it'd be worth it at $600. Um... Simply because, like Eden said, it's just, like, something you put on your face. There's, like, like value-wise, you know, like, when it comes to, like, yeah, it's it's, it's, a, it's kind of a step forward for, like, game development. But at the same time, there's no real value for a gamer to want to have one right now. Or even as soon as possible, because there's, like, there's still not as many games as there could be. I mean, like, it's funner to watch someone play Oculus than it is to actually play Funner. yourself or, you know, buy that and play it yourself. Yeah, that's probably arguable. I mean, you know, maybe some people do have different preferences. For it's player. opinionated. I mean, it is opinionated, but my, 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 what I'm saying is, like, uh, would you rather go pay $600 for a piece of technology that there's no games for, or would you rather, you know, go on YouTube and watch, like, your favorite YouTuber play Oculus, you know, Mm, that's for free. You can still see the games right. that they do have for it, and you get like somewhat of the experience. You know, you do get to see a little bit about it, and you don't have to, you know, come out of your pocket just to experience That'd it. That'd be so disorientating watching someone play the Oculus. Right. You're, well, you're tracking their head movements. Oh, you mean like watching? Screen, no, watching. I don't mean like that. You'd see the actual. Uh, have you not watched any gameplay of someone playing Oculus? I have not. Okay, so well, they have like a they do, do have like the capture card system still or whatever, like because you hook the Oculus into the uh, computer. Mm -hmm. So if you were to capture, it'd be the same way if you were capturing a game. You know, everything like you'd still see the game or whatever, and then like depending on what kind of camera they have, either their their face would either be in a box or just not there at all. So you wouldn't technically see hmm. them; you just see the game. Interesting. I I have to agree that. The, the price point and the whole system as it is now is not for, like, the casual gamer or the casual crowd whatsoever. But I think it's fair for getting that technology out there and getting it to the hands of the professionals that are would be working with this kind of technology and can give feedback to help further development of it into a point where it's at a more cheaper state. I mean, fair enough. Also, I just realized another sort of uh, difficulty that VR is going to have is, like, getting developers to support the VR. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I'm sure that, like, there will be a lot of, like, AAA uh, companies that do, that will have, you know, pub big publishers, like, pushing for oh, their own proprietary. Uh, yeah, I can see that coming out soon. 
but like it's gonna have to like what is it, if I were an indie company making a uh, uh, like first person shooter or any kind of like three D first person game that would be, use the Oculus. So like I, or just use any VR goggles in general. If there are several different goggles, is that like AP, Is that like interface going to be approximately the same? So I can use like Sony's version of the no, VR goggles. No, their interfaces and... are slightly different. So I mean, you'd you'd still have to change some things around. Right. But I think largely, if you were doing that, you could kind of you could have like a standard for what it is, and right. then you could kind of experiment with it a bit and see which one works better with which. System. I guess just what I'm asking is, how difficult is it going to be to make my game uh, compatible with just VR generally, and not just one specific? Uh, yeah, I think it's generally pretty simple because a lot of times. Well, I'm saying that that's that's what's going to determine like whether developers decide. Yeah, to yeah like whether or not the the VR really becomes a big thing. So like it also depends on your engine that you're using. Right. So, I mean... Well, I feel like most modern engines support the Oculus. Or support... Yeah, the Oculus, maybe, in some way. Yeah. yeah. I can see, like, more indie companies um, starting off with Oculus versus, you know, the AAA. Because the AAA are going to want to take the risk for it. Because, like I said, there's still that huge risk out there. Uh, well, there are a lot of, like, AAA companies that are developing their own goggles, specifically. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, see, then that, that's the thing, though. Because, yeah, like, because yeah. in that way, they can they have their own version of how it works, you know? Now that they have that Oculus technology out there, they can just um you know they can make they can tweak it to their benefits or whatever so i am looking forward to see to seeing like all of the different capabilities that you know companies and people come up with because a lot of interesting things have happened off of small things that no one thought it would be huge things yeah i think there are definitely some like cool and interesting things you can do with vr but I kind of persist that like it's not really going to change the industry that much and that it will sort of remain in the sort of like in the just, I think it, it's a really good comparison for, like, uh, the movie industry and, like, how 3D is, like, it's, like, it's there. And people go and do 3D movies and stuff like that. But it didn't really change a whole lot. At least on the, like, viewer side of things. It has the potential to change things. I mean, it's, Well, I mean, not... I, I get what you're saying. Like, it, it just depends on, like, who... Like, someone has to... It has to be that one person that comes, you know, and be the guy to lay the work down so that it does have that impact. But if we don't have that guy, then I agree. Okay. All right. So, any closing thoughts on the Oculus or VR in general, guys? I just think it's going to be the gateway. The gateway like, drug? Once that technology gets out there, they're going to start working on that more and more. And, like, before you know it, we're going to have, like, the full, like, out-of-mind experience stuff. Okay. Like, give it 30 years. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, that, that's definitely a, a cool idea, but I don't know, I'm skeptical, so. I can see it happening. I don't know how long it'll take, but I can definitely see it happening sometime in our lifetime. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I'll still be alive. Even that. if I'm an old man, I'll still be playing games, so whatever. <laughs> yeah, just like 95, like, I can still oh, I'm not going to live to 95. Oh, okay, well, you're optimistic. Give me 40 years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, now we're going to do a new section of the podcast that we call Why Your Favorite Games Suck. Yeah. And uh, today I'm going to be talking and arguing that Pokemon kind of sucks. And I will be arguing that John is wrong. Okay. I will also be arguing that John is wrong. All right, oh. John. State okay. your case. Okay. So just recently, I went ahead and I picked up uh, my copy of uh, of. Pokemon Diamond and Pearl just recently. Um, okay. were, were they okay? Because they were okay. I really enjoyed those when I played them. Uh, at the time when they came out, they were good. Uh, once Platinum came out, they were it kind of improved on the whole generation tenfold. Really? Yeah. Okay, I didn't know like, that. Did you, did you know Diamond and Pearl, there are three fire types you can get in those games. Really? Three? Yeah. Like three like pure fire types. Well, not pure, just like to get like through like to get through the, the Elite Four, there's Three fire types. It was like the the starter. They could get Chimchar, like Ponytas, and something else I can't remember right now. So the, really? Yeah, it's rough. Wait, so three but it's, fire types. <laughs> it's rough. Wait a minute. Platinum made it a lot better. Okay. Yeah. I'll just take your word for it for the yeah. time being. But that's not why. That's not why I'm yeah, saying. Oh, I hate it. Just fun fact. Not, right? But so basically, I was like, oh yeah, I'm getting back into Pokemon. I'm gonna I'm gonna min max the shit out of my team, and I'm just gonna get all the best Pokemon, see what their stats are, and I spent like all this time like getting my team together. Like and then 
I, I like spent a lot of time looking at like items of what was like the best for like training certain Pokemon, like what was the best for like you know what you know, best damage, and I calculated like oh there's like stab damage too, and there's like all these like really cool like mechanics that go into the battle. Yeah. And then you start the battle, and then it's just like oh well I, I think I know what attack I'm just going to use for like every situation. Well, you're talking about just like in in game during the like the story or like I'm talking like. Just like going around and like grinding, training Pokemon, and also just kind of going up against trainers too. Well, yeah, I mean, the AI trainers, trainers in the game are not. So you're you're complex. saying that the core of, of Pokemon then is actually like PvP and like facing like other. The, the core of Pokemon is collecting monsters, seeing what and you're that, gonna get, and so making a team that you like. That part is fun, but I'm arguing that kind of the, like what breaks Pokemon is the fact that as you're getting a team together to like fight other Pokemon. And then the fighting isn't great because well, yeah, well the the AI trainers are not good. Well, then I what mean, what is supposed to be good about uh, you, no, I, get, I get what you're saying. I get what playing you're saying. other people. What playing against other people? So you're saying that Real that's people. the ideal way to play Pokemon? Well, if you're if you're doing what you describe, where you're grinding, getting good move sets, and getting like learning the items and stuff, then yeah, that's where it all culminates. Is the competitive scene against other people. But I don't want to really, I don't want to play competitively, though. See, you know, you know the thing. You're, you're coming in with the wrong mindset. Well, no, but it's, you know, it's look, Pokemon is a single player game. There's like a huge story mode. Well, not, you know, it's a, there's a story mode to it. And you can play the entire game and enjoy it yeah. without, uh, without facing, uh, other people. Yeah. Other humans. Yeah. But like, I just think the, the combat is so like flat and it's just like, oh, well, I've, I've, at this point, I've got like a level 100 septile, and so just pretty much just every situation, <laughs> every situation is just like, oh well, I know I'm just going to come into this battle leaf, leaf, blade. leaf blade. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm curious if you're trying to get back into the Pokemon, like why did you pick up Diamond and Pearl? Well, but it's just it's just the one that I had and the one that I had all my level 100s in. So. Okay. Okay, so for your, because I also ran into because I he has a valid point, you know, when you're just like. Like, if you're in a situation where you either can't connect to people, you have no one to play with or whatever, then, you know, you're sitting there and you're playing the game and you want it to be more fun, but you're, like, kicking the AI's ass, like, really, really easy. And so what I did was uh, I, like, started playing hacked versions. Like, I tried to play them as fair as the actual game mm -hmm. was because, you know, if you, like, just do all the cheats and everything, it's like, yeah, that's lame. It's cheap. It's not, you're not actually playing Pokemon. Um... So, and with the hack versions, what I found was um, they make the trainers harder to beat. Okay. So, yeah. that's the, that's yeah, the only plus. they make the AI thing. a lot better. They make the AI a lot harder to beat, and that actually has made it, like, a lot funner, because then you, you have to, like, you're, you're sitting there, and you're thinking, like, I can't beat this guy. I tried five times. I can't beat him. His Pokemon only one level is stronger than mine, <laughs> but I can't beat him. Right. And so what you do is you go through the grasslands, you fight wild Pokemon, you, grind you go... Out. You go back to fight, um, you know, like past trainers. You fight them. You just keep fighting as much as you can until you go back and like, okay, I think I can beat them now. And so you know what helps in those hack games too is that you can usually, like, if you're on your computer, you can usually speed them up. Yeah. Like your yeah. plus like shift or something, you're like super speeds. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. And that, that's another thing that was really like really good. Like, I'm not trying to advocate for like uh, hacked, you know. But it's well, just, there, are, there are a lot of really good hack ROMs out there. Yeah, people. like the one I play is uh, Dark Rising and Dark Rising Two, and like, they well, actually started doing the hack, or they started figuring out ways to do the hacked version of games for um, the DS as well. Yeah, they, they what I really want to see, like, um, which would inspire me to go pick up a DS as soon as possible, is like if they made a Pokemon that was closer to a hack version. Like, there's more... Because Pokemon is generally very cheesy. They stick to, like, the same, like... It's for kids. It's, it's for kids. Yeah, you but play like, it. Oh, yeah. It, it's, it's for kids, Pokemon. but, like, at the same time, you know, they could make it slightly harder. Or, or darker. A slight, like, you know, slightly more immersive. Like, like, like not necessarily darker, but, like, because... Even in Pokemon Blue, like, a very like one of the very first Pokemon, you know, like, they said... Far in depth, you mean? Yeah, like, I, like more immersive just in general. Like, like in some of the newer Pokemon, I don't even know if it's still the same. Like, you can customize what your character's actually wearing, right? 
which is cool because you know that allows for that immersion. But what I think is like you know you want to be more, you want to feel like a Pokemon trainer and not just like this OP guy walking around killing everyone. Okay. Like, as far as like content and story goes, for like getting more in depth and yeah. like hinting they don't more do that dark though. subplots, the newer like X and Y, there is some of that in there. But you have to keep in mind that as much as like adults will love that game and stuff, it's for kids. Mm-hmm. Still, and but like the, the hack versions, they're not even all that evil. Like, uh, the, at least not the, the one I'm playing. It's like it sticks to the whole cheesy. It depends like, on which hacked version you're playing. There are some dark ones out there. Oh yeah, yeah. I is know, there, like, is I there a, uh, a hack called like Pokemon Uranium or something like that? Yeah, that's supposed is. to be like really dark. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty dark. Oh, is that the zombie one? Mm, it's a zombie. I don't know. I just, I just heard that Pokemon Uranium was like Pokemon super Uranium was one where from a death, if I think. any of your characters die, it's that actually die they die and it then shows like a little thing after a battle oh um, yeah like huh. your character digs a grave for the pokemon yeah. oh wow and it's like that's brutal wow that is no really i've got dark. a few suggestions for you okay John, oh, if you're trying okay. to let's, make let's the much. experience a little bit more intense more interesting um and diamond pearl i mean these exist in every game so far there's the battle facilities they can go to which I don't remember what they're called in Diamond Pearl. I think there was like a whole one there. Gym. I think where it you've was got, just called a battle facility. Yeah, I think that one's got like multiple choices there. Where usually like the standard one was where it'll flatline all your Pokemon out to level 50. Okay. And you'll go against endless stream of trainers up until like I think 50. Where you earn like a special badge. Where like each, tr- each fight gets progressively harder and harder. Uh, the AI teams are become more tailored to beat your team. Okay. Um, and like you do actually have to employ strategy, and that's where you're gonna find the toughest AI opponents. Okay. I see. Um, otherwise, just for the straight story mode, are you familiar with the Nuzlocke challenges? I do know what the Nuzlocke okay. challenges. Okay. Uh, those where... those are where you have to be extremely conscientious. Yeah, those are really fun. Yeah, those are hard. I've only completed that like twice. Do they, do they still have contest in um in the newer Pokemon? Yeah, but they're lame. Well, like. I don't, I don't know, like, because I can't even remember which game it is anymore. Like, I think it was, like, I think it was a hack version of Sapphire. Ruby and uh, Sapphire is when they introduced the contest. Yeah. And that's one, I actually like those. Because they, uh, they're really good. They were I like really them, yeah. too. And they, they redid they them. them. Like, they redid them in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. Uh-huh. Like, bone to bone. But, uh, like, if you get to Diamond and, uh, Fourth and fifth generations, they're sixth generations, they're awful. Yeah. Ugh, there's like musicals. So and in stuff. Alpha, yeah. Alpha, Alpha <laughs> Sapphire, they're, they're actually good? Yeah. Okay. It, it's so. what Ruby and Sapphire was. It was the old Okay, because those were really good. Like, yeah, you know, they were fun. Huh? And, also, and they were hard. Yeah. That, like, when you ran out of stuff to do, like, you beat the main story or whatever, and you just wanted to run around. I just did contests. Like, what I did was, um, I had a Pikachu or whatever, and, like, I made a mate with a Clefairy so I could get Pichu, because I didn't have another Pichu. And um, so I had two little Pika oh, or two little Pichus. Um, you just take it to the daycare, bro. Don't it's not worry that. about it, man. <laughs> little kids can do it, egg so groups, it's, it's okay. Egg groups, man. Don't worry. Okay. About it. Eggs, man. So um, you don't actually see the mating process. Well, I you know don't... that. So I had two little Pichus or whatever, and I just kind of like had them with, with different stats and see what would work or whatever. And so I just kind of put them in contests. Like one would do this kind of, like an aggression contest, and the other one would be like you cool, right. tough. Yeah, like cool, beautiful. cool, tough. Like in. It was really fun. Like I just, I could, you could do fun. that for hours. That's like a real, a really good replay value, right? With you know, just with contests. Those were fun. Yeah, I mean they were fun at the time, but yeah. I go back and do them sometimes. Also, we uh, we uh, quickly glanced over it, but the Nuzlocke challenge is where. Uh, what are the rules for it? Is Nuzlocke challenge: you can only catch the first Pokemon you find on each yeah, route. If right. your Pokemon dies, they die. You cannot use them anymore. You have to put them in the PC. There's one other rule that I cannot remember right now. No um, challenge. it's. I got it. Right. I think it's the. Oh, you have to you nickname all your. Po- you gotta nickname all your Pokemon. Or wait, what's the one that you can breed them? You can breed them. Yeah, but it's that if you catch a male twice, uh-huh. then you can switch it out for the first female you touch. Yeah. Very specific rules. It's yeah. it's tailored around making the experience much more challenging and personal because you get attached to your Pokemon. Right. And there's the permadeath system. And you now. get really sad. Well, when wait. You lose so yeah. is this like a, you a different put game effort, mode? You put time into those yeah. levels. Is this a different game mode? Or no, it's like, just no. it's it's like a it's self enforced. Rule. Yeah, it's self inflicted rules. You have to fa- abide by them. Oh, yourself. so like you there's like no look them up on the internet and then yeah. you play that way? Yeah. 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 Kind of Ouch. like there's also another one where you can't exceed the because like each gym leader has like a region that counts as theirs that you can't exceed like their level. Oh, okay. Which makes it even really? harder. Wow. 
I haven't seen that one. You can't beat Brock. Uh, it's but just yeah. another rule that's added in there. Generally, I think you were kind of going into it the wrong mindset with the wrong environment. Like, okay. There are ways to make it more challenging, but if you're just sticking to the computer and AI and you're not looking to like play against other players, it's for the most part, it's not going to be too difficult. Okay. I have been success, uh, successfully convinced yeah. that uh, I mean, Pokemon does not suck. I, I've spent many hours in Pokemon. Okay. I have as well. Just I, like I have a lot of uh, perfect IV nature. <laughs> I, I used to play competitive a lot, and I still do a little bit. But okay, yeah, you whoop my ass. All right, what have you guys been playing this this week or recently? I've got a lot to talk about. Go right ahead. All right, I'm gonna. Li- I've been playing a lot of games. I got a lot of good games recently, but I'm gonna limit myself to one per week. And this week, I'm gonna talk about Digimon Cyber Sleuth Story. <laughs> So, Digimon, if you like Digimon, this is the game for you. This is the pinnacle of games for you. It's basically, it was designed for the 15th anniversary of Digimon. And it's for the people that watched Digimon as a kids but are now adults, like me. So you're going to be roughly around, like, 22 years old. And what it's done is it's taken a much darker, like, story and tone while still keeping it pretty lighthearted in a lot of spots. But it, it feels a lot like Persona if you've ever played that. Um, there's a lot of swearing, a lot of talk about, like, sex and stuff. Um, and it's just great. You can get, like, any Digimon you want. Like, if you want just the weird Digimon, a lot of them are in there. If you want, like, all the really cool hero Digimon, you can get those. If you want, like, the big bad ones, you can get those. Uh, I'm a little upset that some of the feet, like, some of the mechanics from the older games that I really didn't like have made its way here. They've still survived all these ways through. So, like, getting your Digimon to, like, ultimate and mega levels can get really pain in the butt because it's not like Pokemon where you just reach a certain level and they dig- and you can Digivolve. You have to reach a level and then you need stat requirements. And some of the s- stats are really just weird where, like, they're not good stats where that Digimon would learn normally. So you have to, like, take them to the farm, which is... One of the, I hate that feature where you have to, like, outside work where like they have to just train on their own to increase a certain stat and it takes a set amount of time it's awful but the payoff is just there you get all the callbacks all the, like they animated all the digimon super good it's everything you want it's everything you want as a digimon fan and it's wonderful every single digimon can turn into any other digimon like it, it'll take work but you can do it is that impressive i don't know i've never played it is digimon, impressive so. they, they're ever soon they're not using all the digimon because there's a lot. There's more than Pokemon. Okay. Um, there's about 260 in this game, something like that. 240 to 260, which is perfect. Like, you don't really need more than that, and it's a not lot of mention, options. That, that's not even all of them in the whole, like, game universe. Oh, there's so many. There's, like, more than a thousand. Mm-hmm. It's ridiculous. And a lot of them are just, like, recolors. It's like you got Leomon, and then you got Arctic Leomon, who is just Leomon that's blue. It's, it's but they do dumb, digivolve but... differently. Yeah, they do. Okay. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, if you like Digimon, buy that game. It's only for the PS4 and Vita, which kind of sucks, but hey. Do you own a Vita, Jason? I don't. Okay. My roommate has a PS4, so I bought the game for PS4. Okay, cool. Why would I have a Vita? No I, don't, Vita. I don't know. You seem Vita like maybe the kind of guy that would have a Vita. Vita doesn't have any games. Why would I play the Vita? All right, Ian, you? Um, actually, what I've been playing, I've been playing Fire Emblem Fates. Okay. And I've been really enjoying it. Um... <laughs> One of the things that I think they did really well this time around, as far as, or opposed to Awakening, is that they tailored, they made three different campaigns, and they tailored all three of them to different, or three of their different audiences. One being the people that have been through all the fire, like all the earlier Fire Emblems, who still like a really tough challenge and yet still enjoy the gameplay. They have a, a one for the new people who prefer kind of like Awakening, where it's still, it's more lighthearted and it's not as serious. Right. Of a campaign. It's meant to be kind of more fun than, like, how should I put it? It's meant to be more fun than going for difficulty. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then there's the third route, which is going to be coming out in two weeks. And it's kind of like the in-between the two. So I have a feeling most people are going to really like the third one. Because it gives both the enjoyment of Birthright, which is the simpler one, yet the a fair amount of the difficulty of Conquest, which is the more difficult one. Okay. Now... What's the third one called? I didn't know they were making the third it's one. It's called Revelations. If Revelations. I'm okay, I might have actually heard of that then. Yeah. So I really liked Awakening, and that's only because I liked matching the people up and getting kids. Yeah. So which one would you recommend for me? I would personally recommend Birthright for you first. Yeah. 
After that, if you can beat Birthright on hard difficulty, then I would say you can try Conquest. Okay. Because Conquest, I've played through a good majority of the original Fire Emblems. Yeah. They are much different than Awakening. Awakening was a walk in the park for most people who had played the old Fire Emblems. Because in the old Fire Emblems, you didn't have any chances to grind for levels. Oh, yeah. Um, do they have, like, the weak character that gets really strong? Yes. Like Donald from they Awakening? They have Mozumi, and she's so adorable. Oh. I love Donald in the Awakening, because he had a pot on his head. Uh -huh. And he got super strong. <laughs> Mozumi is hilarious, because... I mean, she has a very similar attitude to Donald. Yeah. And at times, like, you'll, she'll just have, like, random assortment of, like, buckets and pails on her head. <laughs> it's amazing. And, and it's, like, it's her armor, and it's, like, you look at it, and it's, like, this makes no sense, but it's so... <laughs> now I gotta get that game. Like, and, Ross from the old games, who turns into a cool pirate. Yeah. He was awesome. And then, um... <laughs> I'm actually really looking forward to Revelation because one of the things that I find really cool about it is that you get every single character in both games oh, put cool. into one. That's cool. So there's like, God, I think there's like 40 different characters in total. So I've never played Fire Emblem. So like when you say every character, are, are, do they still have like Marth and like Roy no. and all the people from Smash Brothers? Or? No. Fire Emblem okay. is much like... Um, it's kind of like Marvel, is that there's all these different sub-universes, okay. which they explain through um, Deep Realms. and sub-universe? I thought it was just as time goes by. Some, so yes. I thought Mark some, was supposed to be like the hero prince from Legend. Some are. Some are different timelines. Some are different timelines. Some are different universes. Some are hmm. different multi-universes. Okay. Kind of like in Awakening, it's that um, Krom, Lisa, and what's-her-face? Lucina. No, the other, yeah, Lucinia, are all descendants of Marth. Okay. But in mm -hmm. um, Fates, it's that none of them exist because they're in a completely different universe. Okay. It's that, but people from one universe have, have heard about them through tales on folklore. Okay, cool. You no, know, if you like Fire Emblem, but you don't like any of those three games, you can choose the fourth version, which is Choose to Smash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep, sounds about right. All right, George, what's your, what's your favorite game this week? George left, man. He's what? Gone. George. He's gone. George. Sorry. George. Oh, snake. But anyways, I've been playing, uh, or I played uh, the Beginner's Guide finally. After uh, Ooh. you, you Ooh. recommended it on, on a podcast before. That's that's rough. I yeah. it's okay. So you said it was going to be like super like a super like emotional experience. A lot on the last. Did you not feel anything? I did. But it was more like, it wasn't like what I was expecting. Like, I feel like you led me to believe that it's going to be like, oh, there's going to be like characters and stuff oh, like no, that. Oh, no, no. It, but it's actually, like, it And I'm going to get like characters. really invested in some of them and some of them are going to die. But like, no, it was completely different. It's it was super heart-wrenching at the end. Like, you well, feel so bad for this guy. Yeah. It's like, it was very like, it was way more like meta than I thought it was well, going to be. Well, what do you, Stanley Parable is all meta. Well, I, I don't know. But the way that, I don't know. I just thought that like, oh... I was just thinking, like, oh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be, like, with real characters. No, and stuff. there are no like characters. Real story there's two effect. characters, and you never meet them. Yeah. But, yeah, that game was really good. I'd that recommend it. So Especially good. if you really like heady sort of, like, games. Though I was a little bit disappointed that it was as linear as it was. Because, like, Stanley Parable yeah, was, like... Yeah, Stanley Parable was all about non-linearity. Yeah, And this yeah. one was just follow the story. Yeah, well, pretty much. I think it was designed to be like that. Well, yeah, others. that's fine, in, in my opinion. Yeah, but. it's just, I was expecting something more like, oh, I'm gonna... I, I remember... Do you remember the room where there's all of the, like, uh, like comments that are supposed to be left by people on the internet? Yeah. I remember I, like, looked at every one of those because I thought that there actually was going to be, like, an achievement for looking at oh, all of them. Oh, that would have been funny. Yeah. That would be meta. But, like, I don't actually <laughs> think that there were any, like, achievements for this game. No. So. I, just... I mean, I think the Beginner's Guide, and I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. No, go right ahead. But I think the Beginner's Guide is a really good example for um, people who, wanting, who are wanting to get into the game industry mm -hmm. and who are wanting to be game designers, because it shows, like, how, what you're going to have to go through. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you mean, like, as in sort of, like, a... Uh, you mean like the game shows off like it, what it it shows off the process of someone who's coming into it like completely blind mm -hmm. who are, isn't like trying to go through any education for it who's just trying to go off of their own talent uh, I guess that's and I mean you, even to a point people who have gone through a slight education I mean us for example I think we can still learn a lot from that game as well you mean like what the like story tries to say or do you mean like the way that it tells all the levels that, that yeah. you go through is all mm -hmm. progression of this guy's yeah. skills so hold on i so i 
I was assuming this whole time that these are fictional characters. Are you guys assuming that they're actually no, the real, character real characters? Hate, characters? The character is him. All those yeah. levels that you go through are his. Okay. Um, he, but the story... Hasn't he? Huh? Hasn't he even said that? Time? You mean, the, you mean yeah. the narrator's levels? Yeah. Yeah. Like, the story implies that? that it's about the uh, the other guy, but that's just for story's sake and to make that game really emotional. Okay. But uh, the it's it's more or less his tale. Because I didn't get the impression that they were the same person, Coda and the narrator. Yeah, no, you weren't supposed to get that impression. Yeah. Uh, that was so, for story's sake. Well, so are you saying so? Are you saying that's one hundred percent certain that it's it, can, like, it can't be interpreted a different way that they're actually just two characters? Unless I was lied to, I, I thought it was By like who? in an interview. By the guy who wrote it. Yeah, oh. that, I mean, I, from what I've been told, that there are interviews. I never looked into it myself, saying that that was a story about his progress and mm-hmm. stuff like that. But most like the story where he's like begging yeah. for forgiveness and stuff is just for sure. story's sake. I think it. I think he. It was like a friend. Okay. Air quotes around a friend. So I kind of I thought about that too, but like at the same time, I could also like see it being interpreted another way, where it's like, oh no, that he did actually know a guy who was like making these games. Uh, but I don't know. I think it's, I think it's, it's left sort of in, in, intentionally ambiguous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that's what uh, both those games are supposed to be. So right, good games. Yeah, good both games. Both, both Stanley games. Parable and uh, Beginner's Guide both great games. Yep. All right, we time we good to wrap up here, guys. I think so. Sounds good to me. I want to go all home. Right. All right, uh, we'll see all of you listeners later. Well, we won't. We won't actually see you, but like, well, we'll hopefully hear your comments and your criticisms and all the yeah. nice things you have to say to all us. All the nice yeah. things you have to say about us. So oh, give me the hate. All right. Absorb it. See you guys later. Bye. Bye Demon Hearts. See Forgot ya. the plug section. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get that in there. <laughs> bye Demon Hearts. Oh good job guys. I like that. <laughs>
The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are solely those of the original speaker. These views and opinions do not necessarily represent those of Milwaukee Area Technical College.